2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning from verse 1. Verse 1 through 13. Chap uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 13. And like uh, yesterday, I also invite um, two people, one from this side, one from the, uh, this side, uh, to read and um, interchange, please, so that uh, we can hear each other's voices. So who, uh, from now, uh, we will start from this side with uh, the odd-numbered verses. Who would like to volunteer from this side to read the odd-numbered verses? Anyway, just... You? All right, thank you. Yeah, uh, what's your name? Sharon, Sharon yes, that's right. Yeah, Sharon will read from the odd number verses from here. Who'd like to volunteer? Who? Amy? Yes, Amy, do you have your Bible with you? Okay, so Amy, you will read the, the even number verses. So Sharon, you start with the first one. Thank you, thank you, Sharon and Amy, for reading the uh, scripture for us today. All right, so the second um, uh, uh, session today, my theme or my title is It Starts with Christ and It Ends with Christ. You remember yesterday, I already said that when we think about discipleship, we simply put, what is discipleship? I'm quizzing you. Who remembers? Yeah, it's countercultural, right? Something that is not the norm that the culture is uh, is telling us, right? What else is in this? What's that? <coughs> to be like Christ. Yes. Um, uh, uh, the the the, um, uh, the focus is to be like Christ, and sure, to be like Christ is countercultural because the norm is against what Christ is giving us, right? What else do you remember from uh, yesterday uh, about discipleship? So counterculture to be like Christ. Anything else? We spent two hours last night. So yes, uh, it's ecclesiastical meaning connected to the church. Yes, a family and the church, right? You cannot do it alone. Um, uh, 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 we have to do this together. Excellent. Excellent. What else? Yes. It's intergenerational, and that's what's wonderful, right? You cannot do it just by yourself. Intergenerational, from grandmother to mother to now, and then you go next, right? Good. Anything else? Yes. Say it louder, please. It's done. Very good, yeah? Because uh, this is what discipleship is all about, right? So today, in the second session this morning, we will look at this. It begins with Christ, it ends with Christ. So we are in Christ. Now, think about that concept. We are in Christ. What does it mean? When you think about something is in something else, so I have a cup of tea here, 
uh, I do not mean to outdo Louis, but you know this is this is always a uh, good right. So when you uh, when I say that the T is in this cup, right? The T is in this cup. Then it means that the T is contained by the cup, right? The T cannot go anywhere else. It can only stay here. So the discipleship and also the way we live in Christ is also like that. We are all in Christ. We are all in Christ. So Christ is almost like the container for our being. Christ is everything. I mean, for the T to exist, in, uh, as a T in this cup, it has to be inside, right? The T will only the T will only serve the purpose of making me refresh, right? Let me just very good. Actually, I like this tea. The jasmine is so fragrant. I loved it, right? But then my point here is that for the T to fill to fulfill its purpose. This tea has to be inside the container. And so also with us, right? For us to fulfill our calling of who we are, we must be in Christ. We must be inside Christ. And the reality is that we are already in Christ. That we are already within Christ. But then again, Christ is without boundary. Just think about this. Who is Christ? Jesus, right? Who is Jesus? How do you explain Jesus in one sentence? Think about this. When people, when your friends from school or from work ask you, okay, so you talk about Jesus all the time. You Christians, you talk about Jesus all the time. Who is this Jesus? How would you answer? Who is this Jesus that you keep talking about, you sing about, pray to, well, who is this Jesus? One sentence. Talk to your neighbors. I'll give you half a minute. Talk to your neighbors. Try to find the answer. Talk to your neighbors. Give us answers. When people ask you, who is Jesus Christ? Give me one sentence of an answer. Half a, half a minute. One sentence. One sentence. Okay, give us some answers. Um, uh, who is Christ? Back there. The, the three people sitting by the brain over there. <laughs> Who is Jesus? Yes, you. Um, our Savior. Our Savior. Very good. Thank you. Excellent. Over here. <laughs> Who is Jesus? Oh, the Son of God. The Son of God. Very good. You. This, 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 this section over here. Who is Jesus? <laughs> oh, no, 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 same thing. All right, so be creative. If something is already uh, taken, uh, that's why now, now is the time for you to volunteer the answer because if it's already taken by somebody else, you don't, you don't repeat that. Okay. Yes. Good. Beginning and end. Beginning and end of what? This is very good. Yes. The whole world. Yes. Thank you very much. Beginning and end of the whole world. Thank you. Okay. Over here. Back. Back to you. With Jesus. <laughs> he died for our sins. Thank you very much. Yes. Very good. What else? Over there. Jesus. Who is Jesus? The Son of God. The Son of God. But you already took that. Who? Jesus is the Son of God who is the Son of God. Okay, well then. All right, there you go. Yes. Well, he is Lord. He is Lord. Good. Yes. Oh, wait. 
A friend. Somebody says a friend. Yes. Right? Okay. So, uh, we have so many answers about Jesus who are so wonderful, right? Uh, from very theological, the beginning and the end of the whole world, to uh, another theological statement, he died for us, he, he, he died for our sins, right? That is the Jesus that we love, that we believe, that we adore, that we worship. And as I said, this Jesus is without boundary. This Jesus is without boundary. But at the same time, he is with us and we are in him, just like the tea is in the cup. And that is a wonderful reality of being Christians. And I really want to, uh, I, I really want to share this passion with you, right? And then in turn, I want you to share this passion to other people. Because let's think about that. I want to start uh, actually um, uh, uh, by thinking about Jesus with the beginning and the end of the whole world. Now, when you think about the book of Genesis, and this morning, um, uh, Omar already preached from Genesis also, right? Uh, uh, the Tower of Babel. But even before that, when you think about Genesis chapter 1, what happened? What did you read in Genesis chapter 1? What's the very first slide? Amy. In the beginning. In the beginning, God created, the God created the heavens and the earth, right? You remember reading that from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How did God create? How? Say it louder. I, 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 I told you, right? I'm getting older and older all the time. If you only mumble, I cannot hear. So shout your answer. Say it loudly. <laughs> yes, of course. How did he do it? How did he do it? Sorry. How did he? He spoke, right? He said, let there be light. And there was light, yes? That's what you mean? <laughs> yes, good. So God spoke, right? Thank you. That is very true, right? God spoke and it happened, right? God said, well, let there be light and boom, there was light. And then God said, let there be the sky. Boom, there was the sky, right? Okay, that is Genesis chapter 1. However, let's think about this. Do you remember another passage in the Bible? And that is John chapter 1, first one. What, how does John 1 verse 1 say? Thank you very much. In the beginning there was the Word. And do you remember the next line? The Word was with God. And then the Word was God. Thank you so much, right? Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is good. I like it, right? So uh, let's keep the blood flowing here, right? Let's think about the Bible as a whole. That's what I'm trying to do with you. So Genesis chapter 1 says what? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the, uh, the earth, right? And then how did God uh, create? By speaking his word. John chapter 1 verse 1 says, does John chapter 1 verse 1 start with the same line as Genesis 1? Yes! In the beginning, God, that's Genesis 1, in the beginning was the word, is John 1. If you hear something similar like that, what do you do to those passages? Ignore it? No way! No! You must pay attention, right? There must be something here. Okay, let's think about John chapter 1. In the beginning was who? The word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Alright. So that's John 1 verse 1. The word was God. But then in John 1 verse 14. Now this is getting more tricky. John 1 verse 14. So open your Bible. Open your Bible and the moment you find it, read it loudly. You remember, oh, Yuja is getting older and his ears are not that good anymore. So you read loudly. John 1 verse 14. 
Whoever finds it first, you read it loudly. Thank you. The word became what? Become flesh. What is flesh? This is flesh, right? This is flesh, right? The word became flesh. Remember, John 1 says in the beginning was the word, right? The word became flesh, and what that what does the word do now? He dwells among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of who? Jesus, yes. Now, think about this. John 1, right? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And then the Word became flesh. Who is this flesh? Jesus. So can you say that Jesus is the Word of God? Of course you can. Jesus is the Word of God, yes? Okay, Lord, let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. How did God create? By his word, yes? He spoke the word. So, 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 so. Let's, let's have fun with this, right? So when God spoke, let there be light. Can you somehow see the word of God? Who is Jesus? Agree? Is the one busy doing it, right? God the Father says, let there be light. And Jesus said, okay, let's do it, let's do it. <laughs> Jesus is the builder. Beautiful, isn't it? Beautiful. Okay, let me give you another uh, verse. So find Colossians 1 verse 15. Okay, let's do the same thing. You try to find Colossians 1 verse 15. Whoever finds it, read loudly. Colossians 1 verse 15. Uh, continue until I say stop. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So here in Colossians chapter one, Paul is talking about who? About Jesus. Who is this Jesus? The Word, right? And in Colossians one verse sixteen, what does Jesus do? He is the Creator. Can you see that? Sixteen and seventeen. That uh, He is the Creator. He is the one creating the whole universe. Without him, nothing was created. Without Jesus, nothing was created. So can you see that? I'm trying to make a connection from Genesis to John to Colossians to think about Jesus. So Jesus is the word of God through whom God created. So imagine this. Imagine this. That when you read Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and 2, and 3, and 4, and 5, and so on, almost like when you were in Sunday school, you thought that God was a magician. Right? God had a magic wand, and then he says, Abracadabra, and voila! The world happened. Mm, think again. You know, when you read the Bible, you must read together, right? Together uh, of the Bible as a whole. When we think about creation, I'm just focusing on creation right now, right? When God creates, actually Jesus is the one doing the creation. God spoke, but somebody is doing it. It's not like abracadabra and then alakasab, whatever you use the, uh, the, uh, the spell. Uh, and then it happens. There is God the Creator, then is Je and there is Jesus, God the Father the Creator, right? God the Father the Creator. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, is the one doing busy work. Right? And so, and of course the Holy Spirit is also there. Today we, we, we celebrate the, um, uh, uh, the Pentecost, right? The Holy Spirit, don't forget the Holy Spirit also. But here, uh, my, my point here is to show the connection between the Father and the Son in the work of creation. 
So Jesus, my point here is still to go that everything starts with Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, who is the creator. And as I said, he is the container of the whole world. And we are in Christ. We are in him. So we, when you think about Jesus, most of the time, most of the time, Christians, when Christians think about Jesus, is it? So here we are in Toronto, right? Living in the year 2018. You are busy with your own stuff. You go to work. You play soccer. You go to school. Uh, you play the piano. You you play band and then run in um, uh, tracks or play basketball, things like that. Here you are in Toronto in 2018, and there was Jesus. I don't know where, long time ago, now he is in heaven. And there is detached between you living in Toronto and Jesus living in heaven. Does it sound familiar to you, this kind of concept? Right? When I meet Jesus, I'll pray. Tomorrow I have a big mathematics test, and it is a very difficult calculus concept. I pray to Jesus. I want him to help me. Or tomorrow I have to make a deal uh, in my bank where I work. So I pray that the deal will go smoothly. Right? And then you got it. You say thank you, Jesus. And you go back to your daily life, daily routine. And, you know, well, you have prayed. And that's it. Does it sound familiar? Many people, many Christians have that kind of concept about the relationship with Jesus. You are entering in and then you are entering out. You are entering in and then you exit it out. Something like that all the time. Whereas the Bible reminds us, the Bible shows us the reality of our life with Christ is that we are in Christ all the time. And He is never detached from us. He is always, always, always with us. And today, again, we are celebrating the coming of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is always with us. So no matter what we do, in whatever situation we are, we are already in Christ. Whether you like it or not, the reality is that you are in. And once you are in, you cannot get out. Because his love, somebody says that when you think about Jesus, Jesus is love, right? God is love. So, he is friend, yes. But it's not a friend in the sense that, okay, so if I want him or her, I'll give her a call. But if I'm too busy with my own stuff, I'm not going to give him a call. No, not like that. We are already in Christ. And so this, we begin, so, so um, it, it all starts with Christ, and, and Paul here, in the letter that, um, that uh, he wrote uh, to Timothy, in, in verse 1 of chapter 2, says that, You then, my beloved child, be strong in the grace that is in Christ. This is a beautiful reminder that we are already in Christ, right? Um... um it starts with Christ and it ends with Christ, as I already say, uh, because we are never departed from Christ. So our life and our, um, our existence is deeply rooted in Jesus Christ. And that is the best reality that you can think of. Jesus, who is the creator of heavens and earth, is also the one who died for us, who redeems us. We'll talk about that a little later today, this morning, right? But you know, you know the, 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 the Christian teaching of Jesus Christ who died for us. But what's important is that He is always with us. As I said yesterday, we are often fascinated by glamorous things. We are often fascinated by physical beauty, right? Somebody who, who looks very beautiful and handsome and then a you know, movie star, uh, and then uh, people are, are attracted to them. And uh, many movie stars, especially if you follow the K-pop, are, are you, some of you are, uh, uh, 
fans of K-pop. Ryan Okay. <laughs> so all those movie stars from Korea, they all look so glamorous and shiny. And you, uh, you think that they are the best people ever. You want to be like them and then uh, you hear that many of these movie stars pay a lot of money for facelifts, all kinds of um, uh, plastic surgery. Did you hear about that? To make their, uh, their nose uh, look much better or the whatever, right? Um, people idolize um, a beauty like them. They want to be like them. Many teenagers and young people have their idol, um, uh, idol um, uh, and they want to be like them. Thank Jesus. Thank Jesus. He is our creator. He is our savior. And he is the one loving us the most. And he is all with us all the time. What a privilege is that? Right? So here, the reality of our discipleship, right? The reality of our walk with Christ is already there because we are already deeply rooted in Jesus Christ. Now you ask me, oh Yuda, how am I? How, uh, how do I know that I am rooted in Jesus Christ? Well, think about your reality. Think about your life today. Think about who you are right now. You are in church, yes? You are. How did you come to church? Maybe you say, well, my parents took me to church. Wonderful. Do you remember last night? The faith of Timothy that started from who? From his grandmother, Lois, right? From his mother, Eunice. And now Timothy has this with him, right? So you say, my parents took me to church. Be thankful to them. Okay, hug them after we are done with this session, all right? And thank them. Thank you, mommy. Thank you, daddy, for bringing us to church, for bringing me to church. Because that's when my root in Christ was started. Or maybe a friend took you to church, right? A friend took you to come here. A friend invited you to come, and then you are now in Christ. And as I already said, once we are in Christ, we cannot get out. He loves us so much that He holds us no matter what. And then we can see that our reality, our presence, is always in Christ. But then we need to focus only in Christ. You remember reading from, uh, from uh, the second chapter of uh, Timothy here that Paul wrote an analogy. The analogy that he used are two, right? Uh, soldiers and athletes. Now, how many of you are athletes of any kind? All right, good. All right, uh, athletes. Um, what, what, do you, uh, uh, what sport do you play? Oh, you know what? <laughs> You still play? Not anymore. Not anymore, but you, you used to play. Well, just to be honest with you, to me, curling is the most fascinating sport ever. <laughs> wow. Curling is the most fascinating sport ever. You, what, what do you call the, uh, the, the rock, right? You are not allowed to touch the rock, but you have to make the rock move. Yes. Yes? That is so fascinating. How do you do that? Now, this is my point. Let me just use curling as, as my example here, right? You have to focus all the time. Is that right? When you, when, you know, how do you move the rock? You have to focus on the rock and what you are doing. You cannot, you, even though you know that your mom and your dad are cheering you over there, you gotta say, hey mom, hey dad, and hoping that the, the rock will move to the direction, yes? Please never come to watch. Oh, well, or your friends, or your girlfriend. This is, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm not going to use your mom and your dad anymore. Your girlfriend. There's this girl. Right? 
this this girl who is um, uh, whom you love very much, and you know she is there watching you. Can you say oh hi? <laughs> no, you can't. You have you have to focus on what you are doing. An athlete should only focus on his or her game in order to succeed, right? And Paul also uses another illustration, a soldier. When a soldier or when a group of soldiers go into war, their concentration, their focus is only on the war. They are trained, they have to be disciplined, they have to go into uh, uh, through training in order for them to be able to win the war. You just cannot have divided concentration. It will not work. It will not happen. You will not win. Whether in sport or in combat, right? Whether in war or in athletic games. Your focus should be just one. And um, may, uh, I'm, not a, uh, I'm not an athlete, I'm, I'm never going to war, I'm not a soldier, but I know a little bit about music. In music, you have to do the same thing, right? How many of you took piano lessons or music lessons any, any time, right? Thank you very much, yes. And you know, uh, 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 are any of you taking or have taken uh, RCM, the Royal Canadian, right? What grade are you? You stop at night, what grade are you? Seven. Nine. So, but in, in RCM, how? What was the highest? Ten. All right. So you just one more. <coughs> one more grade. <laughs> why? Why? Why do you say? <laughs> you hate it so much? Oh, too bad. What about you? <laughs> you stop at what grade? You you finish grade ten. Congratulations. Right. Right. Well. Nine is already a killer. How uh, uh, other people finishing a ten? Nine is already difficult. Ten is a killer. What I cannot do, well, I'm still struggling. I'm, I'm not doing RCM. I'm, I'm, I'm doing the, the Royal School. And uh, for the Royal School, eight is the highest. I'm still working on my eight. The scales, my goodness, the scales, I hate the scales. <laughs> How many of you can say amen together with me? <laughs> amen, thank you. <clears throat> I want to play the pieces. I want to play Chopin or Mozart or Beethoven, right? Why do I have to do the scale and all kinds of combinations and it is hard? But you have to do it. You will never pass grade 10 if you don't do the scales, even when it kills you. Of course, the teachers say, well, this is good for you, good for your technique. Yeah, 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 I know. <laughs> but when I have to do it, it's just a killer. You agree with me, right? But that's the only way you can. If you are not willing to do that, whether you are with 1 or with 2 or with 3 or with 10, you must do that. Discipline. Discipline. And my teacher, I'm, I'm still taking piano, uh, piano class with my friend who is a professor of music in my school. Can you see that? So once a week, every Tuesday afternoon, I'll go to, um, uh, to her office and then she, she'll, be, she'll be drilling me a lot, right? Uh, you can do this, you can do this. You don't. Okay, when, when am I going to be good? Ah, uh, well, maybe never. Uh, I'm still struggling. I'm still struggling. But my point here is concentration and focus. You cannot succeed if you don't concentrate and you don't focus. We know that. So, rooted in Christ Jesus is like a soldier, an athlete, a musician, any kind of trade you are in. You must but the good thing is that Christ is already there, there with us. So we don't have to uh, worry about, uh, about losing Him. No, Christ is already with us. But from our point, <coughs> from point of view, from our uh, side of the game, we must do it. 
And discipleship is also like that, right? We cannot be the true disciples of Christ without doing our part. Whether it's curling or basketball or going into war or being, playing the piano or the trombone or the violin. We must do our part. So this, uh, I hope this is a reminder for all of us, right? The next thing that Paul says is that how are we united with Christ and in what sense? And Paul says that we are united in his death and also in his resurrection. We are <coughs> one in Jesus Christ. And especially when you think about Christ um, in the earlier discussion, we already talked about this, right? Who is Christ? Christ is our Savior. He died for us. And we also rose again with Christ. Now, back to the book of Genesis. So now, a little later, after the creation of the whole world, God um, uh, created this man and the woman, right? Um, um, and then God told Adam and Eve in the garden, you remember the story, right? You may eat which kind of fruit? Only bananas and avocados? No. You may eat all the fruits, right? But, is there an exception? Yes, which one? There's one tree. What's the name of the tree? It's not apple. I'll be very mad if you say it's apple. Alright, what's the name of the tree? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's law, I know. <coughs> so, God said, you are allowed to eat all the fruit, but this fruit, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you are not to eat it. Because what will happen when you eat it? On the day that you eat it, you will die. On the day that you eat it, you will die. Now Adam and Eve ate the fruit. Did they die? Yes, in a way, no, in a, another way, right? Depending, depending on what you mean by death. Okay, that's a big discussion, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go that, that direction, right? Go back to this. On the day that you eat it, you will surely die. Adam and Eve ate the fruit. Did, did they die? In a way, yes, they did, right? In what sense? That they are separated from God. They are then discarded from the garden. And there is a curse that followed sin. So that is death, right? The separation from, uh, from God, the separation from the Garden of Eden, that was death. And we know that in Adam and Eve, we also die. We die in our sin, right? We die. We die in our sin. And we keep, we keep sinning and sinning and sinning until finally we meet Christ. So here, this is a very important theological uh, uh, teaching from, from the church that I really want to share with you. When we are united with Christ, right? When we are united with Christ, we die. Just as much as Adam and Eve died in the sin, right? Just as much as Adam and Eve died and be separated from God, they died. And Jesus Christ also had to die with us. Now, see, in the Christian theology, in, in the Christian belief, we say that all of us, all human beings die together with the sin of Adam and Eve. Right? So there's the death. But, thankfully, Jesus has come for us. When he died on the cross, we are who are also dead in Adam and Eve. We are united with Christ. So we completely died. Died not 
uh, not biologically, you know this, right? It's, it's about spiritual, our spiritual relationship with God. We died. But praise be to God, on the third day, Jesus rose again. And so we, who were united with Jesus Christ in his death, now we are living with him. And there's no more death. Again, I'm not talking about physical death. I'm talking about spiritual death. Now that we are united in Christ, we are completely free from the curse of death, of sin. So if the punishment of sin is con the condemnation in hell forever and forever and forever, now we do not have to go through death at all. We are completely liberated from death and sin. We are completely liberated, we are completely given the freedom. And now, we are living. Can you see that? We are living in the light of Christ. So to be disciples of Jesus Christ, to be disciples of Jesus Christ is already having this reality, this, this life that is completely alive of living, a life that is liberated from sin, a life that is joyful, a life that is to be celebrated, a life that we can enjoy as much as we can because it is a gift. So we are already liberated, we are already saved from all sins, but this is also the good news, that this Give this liberation, this freedom that Christ gives, also applies in all areas of our lives. That we are free people. That we are not in bondage. That we are not enslaved by sin and by anything else. So, we are free to live as the children of God. We are free in the world to enjoy God's creation. We are free in the world to explore every corner of creation. So think about this. This is, uh, this is the joy and the liberation that I want to, to share with you, right? People say that you can be what, whoever you want to be. Right? Um, uh, in terms of your career, in terms of your um, uh, aspirations, in terms of your gift, anything. Any major that you want to choose in college, in the university, go for it. That's all good. You want to be business people, you want to be a nurse, you want to be a doctor, you want to be a scientist, you want to be an economist, you want to go for it. Because all of these areas of life have already been redeemed and be, uh, then we have the freedom in Christ. And that is something that joyful. And that's what I really want you to, uh, to, 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 to have the passion for. All right? So before I continue, I see that it, uh, um, you have some questions in your heart and in your mind here. So if you have a question, go for it. Um, let's entertain some question and answer time right now. Any question on this part? Yes, go ahead. Um, you talked about how um, if you are in Christ, mm -hmm. you can't get out of it. Yes. Um, but what about people who have left the church? Yes, yes. Wonderful question. Thank you for asking this. Remember, I started this talk this morning by giving you the theological concept of Christ is large, right? Christ is without boundary. We are, we are in Christ, but Christ is without, without boundary. And I said that once we are in Christ, we cannot get out. Now, of course, there are the reality of the question, okay, well, I see some of my friends, maybe even family members, who used to be at church, but now they are left. And even some Christians are not hesitated to use the word lost. These are people who are lost.
I don't agree with that approach. When you think about Christ and God um, uh, as the Trinity, right? As I said, that Christ and God, they are, this is very big and, and much bigger than we can imagine. We, human beings, can only see temporarily. Temporarily. We see, okay, well, right now, my friend or my family, my, my cousin, whoever they are, are not in church. But for, for me, my explanation is it is only it's only in our eyes, in our limited understanding. God's knowledge of that person is much bigger than what we can even imagine. So, in his love, in his goodness, in his redemption, in everything that Jesus Christ has done on the cross for us, God knows that that person really belongs to him. Belongs to God. And God will, I'm, 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 I'm sure, I'm 100% sure, that God will always give the opportunity for that person to return. Even, even, split second before death. Even split second before death, God will, will still be giving that person a time to return. Because, God is greater than anything else that we can imagine. Can you see that? So uh, I'm always comforted by the story of the thief on the cross. Do you remember that? Um, this, there's this one uh, who, who cursed Jesus, but the other one said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom, right? Yes, thank you for singing it. And then Jesus said what? The king. You are with me in paradise, right? So you can imagine that these people, whoever that is, um, uh, there are several theories about who the, the identity of this thief. But anyway, my point here is that even on the cross, even when he was in the agony of death, he still had the opportunity to remain, right? And again, my my point here is to show that living in Christ is a comfort. It's a comfort that we do not have to fear those kind of questions because we are already in Christ. Even people whom at this moment you think that they are not in Christ. But the reality again is God knows more than we can know. Now, you are familiar with the Heidelberg Catechism, yes? I'm so glad that the children are also saying the Catechism uh, uh, in the middle of the circuit. What is question number one? What is question number one? Come on. Who can, who can recite question number one? What is? <laughs> what is your only comfort? Okay, oh my goodness, they will have to be catechized again. So yeah. next Sunday, <laughs> next Sunday, it's not the children grade seven and yes. lower, right? Next Sunday is children, you guys, seven and up, all the way to university. All right, and then recite question and answer number one. The question is this, I want you to listen. If you forget this, that's all right, okay? The question is, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And the answer is, that, oh uh, uh, yeah, I know, the answer is Jesus, but it's longer. <laughs> The answer is that I belong body and soul and in life and in death to my faithful Savior Jesus Christ. Alright, that I belong. So what is your only comfort in life and in death? Think about this. Comfort. Everybody needs comfort. We think about comfort food. And for me, comfort food is chocolate cake. If you give me chocolate cake, I'm comforted. All right? Some people will say ice cream. Some people say bath, so I don't know. For me, okay. right? for me, it's chocolate cake. But then, 
what I'm talking about in the catechism theory is that what is your only comfort in life and in death? We want comfort. And the answer is that I belong, how, body and soul, to whom? To our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the only comfort. Right? That's the only comfort. And that's why we can relax. As I said, in Christ, we can relax. We do not have to be tense people. And I don't want you to be tense Christians. Tense Christians are not good Christians. All right? Uh, we, we, I want you to be comforted Christians. And this is always my, um, my illustration about comfort. Think about a beautiful summer day in June where the grass has been mowed completely so your backyard is beautiful and neat. The roses are blooming. The sky is blue and clear. It's probably about 18 degrees Celsius and there's no wind. To me, that's the best. And then you have a hammock in your backyard. Think about this, you have a hammock in your backyard and you just flop on your hammock. There's no care in the world anymore. That's Right? And Jesus is that hammock in that 18 degree day without cloud and without wind. Can you see that? That's the only one. So even for these people, when they are in Christ, Christ sees eternity. We only see temporary. I hope that helps you. Alright, thank you. Other question on this. So I, I'm talking about the freedom that we have in Christ, and now we have the freedom to live. The freedom within this, uh, this life that has been redeemed by Christ. So that's my point. Any question? Any more question? All right, if not, let me continue, right? So uh, we are united in Christ, and how are we united? See, this is the key when we are baptized. When we are baptized, we are united in Christ. And uh, um, I have uh, said about baptism a couple of times in the past um, uh, sessions. Um, baptism is not just a, uh, it, it's not just a, a, a ritual that the church requires people to do. Baptism is a reality. All right, in which we are united with Christ. Now you remember the Great Commission. Somebody talked about the Great Commission yesterday. Uh, Matthew chapter 28, Jesus says, Go make disciples of whom? Of all nations. And then doing what? Baptizing, right? Baptizing them. How? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, right? The Trinity. Now, let's think about baptism a little bit more. Uh, the Greek word for, for that part about baptism in the Greek Commission in Matthew chapter 28 actually um, is, uh, has more depth than the English translation. Uh, when Jesus says baptizing them, in English, it is translated as in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But the original Greek has the preposition into. It makes a big difference, don't you think? In is this, in. The, this, this, this tea bag is in the cup, right? It's, it's the, the actual situation. However, the preposition into is that I put this bag into the cup. Can you see that? There's a direction. There's a direction into. Now, with that, I'm sure you start understanding this. That when we are baptized, we are baptized into the life of the Trinity. Oh, what a wonderful reality is that. Because we were outside, you, you have the idea, that, right? That when we were outside, but now we are directed into the life of the Trinity. So we become a part of the life of the Trinity. 
That is baptism. So we are now attached to the life of the Trinity. The Trinity, Father and Son and the Holy Spirit are so loving and they love us so much and now we are united to be one with the Trinity. And that is when we are united, especially with Christ, because Christ is the Savior, right? In baptism. So baptism has a very deep theological meaning. And once we are baptized in Christ, we are, we are really put into the life of, um, uh, uh, of God. And as I said, once we are in, in Christ, we cannot be detached. So in baptism, we already receive that. In baptism, we already receive the sign. And people often argue, and yesterday, if you were in my session in the Capita Selecta, you remember that uh, uh, I did the activity with the, with the pouring of water to remind your uh, people of your baptism, right? So, uh, many of you were baptized as children, as babies. Many of you were baptized man, uh, many, many years ago. We don't remember. And that's why there is... Uh, um, uh, there's a need for us to be reminded again and again and again and again. So activities like what I did yesterday at the church, and also every time you witness a baptism in the church, it is also a reminder of your own baptism. So when there is baptism at church, don't skip church, all right? Because you said, ah, oh, the service will be long. Um, you know, we don't like it. I mean, we, we don't know the people who are baptized. No, it's wrong. Go. And when there's baptism, you go. Because that's when you are reminded again of your own baptism. And this is the reality. That baptism is not just a ritual that the church does. Baptism is this union with Christ. And for us, that is very significant. Right? That is for us. Now, um, uh, uh, it has to be done within the role of the church. Remember ecclesiastical? I already introduced you to, to that term. This, the, we do this in the church for us so that we can go outside. Remember the Great Commission again, right? Jesus said, go, make disciples of all nations. But of course, you cannot go, just go without preparation, without the foundation. We are giving, given the foundation here in the fold of the church. And so baptism has to be done in the context of the church. So uh, John Calvin is my hero. Uh, he lived 500 years ago and I'm still reading his writings. If you go to my office, I have his whole collection of um, uh, commentary of the Bible. There are, I don't remember, it's 30 some books on my, my top shelf. Uh, is, 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 um, is that, and then his other writings, I have plenty. Of. I love him very much, uh, even though he was lived 500 years ago. He said, first, we must understand that as long as Christ remind, remains outside of us and we are separated from him, all that he has suffered and done for the salvation of the human race remains useless and of no value for us, right? If, if Christ is only 2,000 years ago over there on, 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 on Calvary, uh, and you know the story of Christ, but if you are not connected to Christ, what's the use of it? Nothing. Therefore, to share with us what he has received from the Father, he had to become ours. Look at that. He had to become ours and to dwell within us. This is John Calvin. So in order for the benefit of Christ, in order for all the goodness of Christ that he has done for us on the cross, in order for that to be beneficial for us, he, Jesus Christ, had to become ours. I like this. Now, John Calvin tells us uh, another reality. Uh, um, uh, in the beginning, when we read Paul, um, uh, I, I said that we are in Christ, right? Christ is the, the, the great creator of the heaven and the earth, and we are in Christ. But now, Calvin also wants us to think that Jesus become ours. Jesus belongs to us. 
Jesus belongs to us. That's beautiful. And to dwell within us, to live in us. It's like a union, right? It's like a union. Now, think about a uh, wedding. Uh, think about wedding. You've seen, you've seen uh, a wedding at church, right? Some people cry at weddings. It's so beautiful. The bride is so beautiful, you know. They have, uh, the groom sometimes is forgotten, right? Uh, you know, sorry, guys. I mean, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, the eyes are always on the bride, right? Um, the dress, the flower, the, the beauty, whatever. All right, anyways. But... Now I want to bring in the groom and the wife, the bride together, right? They make a vow. They make a vow. And you remember the vow to have and to hold, to cherish how in sickness and in health until. Thank you very much. Not until a uh, next door neighbor moves in and she's more beautiful than you, and I'll jump you. Now, to have and to hold, to live and to cherish in sickness and health until death do us part. Now, you can see that at that wedding, after the wedding vow, the bride and the groom are united into one. Can you see that? And then the minister will say, I pronounce you, husband and wife, now you may kiss the bride, right? Uh, those are beautiful manifestation of this union, right? This, those are beautiful manifestation of this of this man and the woman to be husband and wife, and then they are sealed with a kiss. That kiss there it, there is so significant, right? So now, once the husband and the wife are united, they belong. To Nobody else can come near, and that's why you wear wedding cake, right? So that nobody can come near you because you are already um, uh, with this other person, with your spouse. That's the union. Now, the, the, the union between us and Christ is like that. It's like a wedding that binds forever. So there is this reality of the union with Christ. That, uh, uh, that, that Calvin said. But, but my point here is also to highlight that Christ becomes ours just as much as we become Christ. And uh, Christ dwells within us. And then the next, uh, another quote from Calvin, I'll give you another uh, quote from Calvin that says, Therefore, the joining together of head and members, so Jesus is the head of the church, we are the members, of the church, that in dwelling of Christ in our hearts. Calvin emphasizes that the in dwelling, Christ living in our hearts, in short, that mystical union. It's called mystical union. Because you know, you cannot see Christ. Christ is in heaven. But the reality is, Christ is also in your heart. Christ is not contained by anything else. But at the same time, Christ is also in our heart. Right? Uh, the mystical union are accorded by us the highest degree of importance. We do not, therefore, contemplate him outside ourselves from afar in order that his righteousness may be imputed to us, but because we put on Christ and are engrafted into his body. In short, because he, is, uh, because he designs to make us one with him. So we are one with Christ. Whether you like it or not, the reality is that you belong to Christ. And Christ belongs to you. Whether you realize it or not, He is with us already. And so that's how discipleship is possible. Without this reality, without us already being united in Christ and with Christ, we cannot do the discipleship. We cannot follow Jesus. Right? Um, um, you know the song that has uh, the line that says, I have decided to follow Jesus. Uh, to me, that is a little bit of an arrogant song. I'm sorry, I'm criticizing that song a little bit. 
uh, because I can decide this as though I can decide. No, the reality is that Jesus has already decided long ago that you become mine. Can you see that? No, I have decided. Oh, who are you? Right? Uh, Jesus has come, Jesus has loved us first, and now we can follow him. That's the mystical union. Any question? So I, I know I give you a very theological uh, explanation here, but I really want to start from here because uh, this is so important and well, you know that I teach theology so this is my life right this is what I do and I always like talking about this um, any question things that you want to um, um, to pursue further of course tonight we will also have the what is it called uh, the night talk whatever um, uh, there will be time for, for you to ask all kinds of questions but within the framework of this uh, presentation do you have questions things that you uh, are curious about things that you want to uh, discuss here. Anything? If not, I'm going to. I still have time, so you know my time is valuable. You know, uh, so let's think about this. Right? When we think about Christ and his work of redemption, oftentimes we only think about our soul, that we are now saved, that we can go to heaven, that we are not um, apart from God. Well, that's true. In a way, that, that, that is true. However, there is more here. When we say that Christ has redeemed us, Christ also has redeemed the whole creation. Christ has redeemed the whole creation. So what does it mean? Does it mean that Christ has redeemed the mountains and the valleys and the river? That is the creation, right? Did Jesus Christ also die for the cows and the sheep in the pasture? Did Jesus Christ die for the stars and the wind. What do you think? When you think about create, uh, the redemption in Christ, right? And um, uh, I started this talk with the reading of Genesis and John and Colossians, right? What does it mean? Do you think, just, just tell me, uh, do you think that Christ only died for people, for human beings like us, so that we can go to heaven? Or is there something more? Talk to your neighbors. We, we have time. So talk for one minute or so. Talk to your neighbor. What do you think? The, the death of Christ on the cross, is it only for human beings for us to go to heaven? Or is it also um, impacting the whole creation, including the stars, the galaxies, the sun and the moon, and the cows, and your cat, or maybe your dog?
not just God the Father, right? Jesus also did the creation. Don't you think that Jesus loves creation so much? The whole creation. Imagine if you made a beautiful painting, if you were a painter, and you make a beautiful painting, right? And then somebody happens to throw uh, ice cream into your painting. Ouch. Right? The painting becomes ugly. Now, you happen to know and you can restore, restore the painting. Are you going to just throw away the whole painting? I don't think so, right? You will try to clean the painting. You will take out the ice cream that made it ugly. You will restore the whole painting. Make sense? Same way as Christ. That Christ has redeemed, well, first of all, yes, human beings, us, so that we can be saved. True. However, think about the rest of creation that Jesus, who is the creator, has made for us, right? So now, redemption is for the entire creation. And therefore, we are also a part of that redemption because we have been liberated. That's why my question about did Jesus die for the cows and the sheep, I was trying to be funny, yes. But at the same time, I'm also serious in thinking that yes, the effect of redemption is also given to the cows and the sheep. That's why if you want to study uh, veterinary medicine, if you want to be a fat, if you want to heal dogs and cows and cats, go for it. Right? Yes? <laughs> Good question. Ah, I love this. I love this question. Do cows go to heaven? Let's think about this. The Bible doesn't just stop with heaven. When you read the book of Revelation, what will happen in the end of the book of Revelation? Jesus will come back, right? Jesus will come back, and what will happen after Jesus comes back? The new heavens and the new earth. Alright? So redemption doesn't just stop with heaven. But the, the end of the book of Revelation is the new heaven and the new earth in which Jesus Christ comes, in which we are resurrected and then we live together with Christ. Does the new heaven also include the cows and the sheep? I think so. Because creation is so beautiful. And then in the book of Isaiah, somebody already said about this, then you will uh, see that the sheep will, will do what? Will, will eat together with the lion. Oh, isn't that beautiful? So the lion will not eat the sheep anymore. Ooh. Lovely, don't you think? Yes. That's the, that's the vision of redemption. And that's where we are. Alright, I have to stop now. But you know that we still have more time to talk about this. I hope, I hope you really learn and uh, start uh, thinking about this. Alright? Thank you for your participation. I'm, uh, I'm going to talk again, right? Thank you so much. Thank you. Good. We'll talk again in the afternoon. This is lunch time. I know you are hungry. Before we before we get to lunch, let's say a quick prayer. Uh, to pray for lunch and breakfast. Okay. So let's take a minute, and let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for opening our ears and opening our minds so that we can hear what you have to say and what you have to say. And we pray that you can continue to work in us, to redeem us, and to clean us slowly from sin, and that we can continue to walk closer to you and to be more like you. Lord, we also want to pray today for the food that we'll be having for lunch. We pray that you bless us and that you can bless our conversation. Lord, 
In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Enjoy lunch. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll take it. Wreck, wreck, wreck. Is it still wrecking? A little. <laughs> oh, gosh, you just unfocus and focus right here. Where is my hand, Recording the whole time. I was 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 I